before we begin this podcast, I have to warn you that what you are about to listen to was not recorded recently. It wasn't recorded in the 2020s even. In fact, this podcast was recorded six years ago in 2016. I recorded it in the Torch Center. It was actually a class. You know, some of the podcasts are done in front of an audience and some of them are done just in a studio environment. It was a long time ago. There were people in the room. It was a class. The audio quality is not great. And the reason why I didn't publish it at its time, I don't really remember, but I just re-listened to the podcast. And it turns out that a lot of what is discussed in this episode ended up in my book, Upon a Ten-Stringed Harp. And I think, if I remember correctly, I didn't want to spoil the book for the readers, so I didn't want to release it before I released the book. At least that's what I recall. But I... I basically forgot about this episode, and recently I rediscovered it, I listened to it, and I kind of can't believe how much material was packed into this one episode. I think I was younger then, I was a little bit sharper, maybe the people had a longer attention span six years ago, today this would end up, I don't know, two, three episodes, and thinking about it, it really spans many chapters of my book. But I figured it's a quiet season now. We just finished with Tisha B'Av. We don't have the month of El for a couple of weeks. I'll release this episode uh, with this disclaimer. It's an old one. The audio is not so great. And the pace and intensity of the subject is a little bit faster than what uh, than what I'm currently doing. But I hope you enjoy, and as always, my address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. And if you hadn't read the book at all yet, this is a chance to peruse or to take a little stroll in the subject matter. If you have read the book, then I guess this recording would serve as kind of a way to pull together a lot of the themes of the book. As always, my address is rabbiwalby at gmail.com. And I hope you enjoy this really old recording, six years old. Enjoy. Okay, so the hypothesis of tonight's talk is that we're here in life to do something, to accomplish something. Once that's accepted, there's obviously, you know, before you undertake the task, before we, you know, you fulfill the mission successfully, you have to know what the mission is. And... We're here to do something, and for some people, for most people, what that precisely is remains a little bit elusive. And I want to introduce a statement of the Talmud that seems to encapsulate everything, but raises a lot of really interesting questions that we will pursue. So the Talmud says that prior to the birth of a child, they're administered an oath. And the oath seems to be like, uh, like the, the, the mission that they're going to undertake in life is all incorporated in that particular oath. And I'm going to read you the exact wording of the oath. It, it, it says, be a tzaddik. The child's instructed to be a tzaddik. Don't be a rasha, which means be righteous. Don't be wicked. If the entire world tells you that you're righteous, still view yourself as wicked. And the last part is, you should know that the Holy One, blessed is He, God, is pure. The angels are pure. And the soul that he placed within you is pure. If you guard it in its purity, good. And if not, if you don't guard your soul in its purity, behold, I will take it away from you. Thus concludes the oath. And I, I think what it's telling us is that it's really, it's really telling us everything. Become a tzaddik. Don't be a rasha. And it has this latter part, which is the soul is so pure. But you have to guard it in its purity. You have to maintain. You have to preserve its purity so it doesn't become impure. And if you do that, great. If you guard its purity, fine. And if not, behold, I will take it away from you. So this is what, this is the, 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 no, no. Th- this is the statement in the Talmud. And I want to, I want to really break it down and kind of ask some fundamental questions before we continue. So what it seems like is that 
Quite simply, if I asked you, what is, according to this statement of the Talmud, what is life's responsibility? You would say three words, be a tzaddik, be righteous. The problem with that is that what exactly classifies someone a tzaddik is a great mystery. I've inspected many sources, and I've found tens of different, not tens, or tens of different statements in Jewish literature that say, if someone does this, they become a tzaddik. Which makes, makes it a little bit more problematic because we're trying to distill what it is precisely that we need to do. And we're told, uh, for example, if someone does mitzvos, then they're a tzaddik. Alternatively, we're told, if someone resists the temptations of their yetzerah, they become a tzaddik. In many places in the Talmud, we're told that if someone battles uh, if someone successfully achieves a, a, a meriting olam haba, if someone becomes eligible to enter the spiritual world, that renders them a tzaddik. So to me, this was always problematic. We're told simply, be a tzaddik, you know, just, just become this kind of person. Well, what is that kind of person? We have so many different interpretations, which makes it problematic. Number one. Number two, we're told, you have a pure soul, and uh, it's as pure as God, as pure as the angels, but it could become impure. And we're told you got to guard it in its purity because if it becomes impure, it's really problematic. So first of all, what's the connection between the two? We're told become a tzaddik. And then we're told preserve the purity of your soul. And uh, that seems to be connected in some way. What does the purity of our soul have to do with becoming a tzaddik? And also what's indicated in this statement is that the purity of someone's soul, it's in flux, right? It can't, it's dynamic. You have a pure soul, but it could become impure. So there are conditions, there's the potential that our soul can become tainted, sullied, right? That can happen. So I want to understand what are the factors that can contribute to our soul becoming impure. Those, that, that, that's, that's the agenda. The agenda is to understand what it means to become a tzaddik and how that relates to the purity and impurity of our soul and how those change. So what I did here, I assembled, uh, there are several, uh, there are several accounts in Jewish literature that describe the spiritual development of a child before birth. And these are very fascinating ideas. Uh, and I, I collected them and I'm going to organize them, uh, chronologically. Cause we're told we have this something called a soul. It's as pure as God, as pure as the angels, but it can become impure. And it's really interesting if you, if you just lay out one after another the various teachings that we find about the soul's development, it seems like we get hints to answer our problem. It seems like we could pinpoint where in the development of the soul, where are those contributors that can potentially deduct from its purity, where they arrive, and that will also be very, uh, very uh, illustrative for how we exactly resist our soul becoming impure. So what I did here is I, I collected three main sources. If you want to know for your curiosity, it's one of them. It's the book of Nida on page 30b. A second one is in the, in the book of Sanhedrin, page 91b. A third one, a very long one, is found in the Midrash in Tanchuma in Parshas Pekude number three. And the question I want to start off with, okay, so we have souls. We know we have a soul within us. We have a body as well. We have a, a basic idea of where our body comes from. We understand the, you know, it, it's, it's basically cells. It's physical matter. Uh, but where does our soul come from? So we know, like, what, where is our soul before we are born. Where is our soul? Bef- uh, is Do we have a soul? Uh, does a child in utero have a soul? Does a child at conception have a soul? Does a child have a soul at birth? Do you get a soul when you're seven years old? When, where is the soul and how, where is this touch point that the body and soul morph and fuse together to become a single entity? The Talmud tells us that there is, that all the souls that were ever in existence are we're all already created during the six days of creation, so there's no new souls. You can't get the new generation, the new edition. They're all the, they're all in existence from Genesis, and they're in a 
chamber in a box in heaven. This is the Talmud in Yavamos. They're in a box, they're in a chamber in heaven. That's where all the souls are. And the Midrash describes what happens at conception. The Almighty has two angels. There's angel number one whose name is Lila. This is the angel that's in charge of the body, of the formation of the primordial biological matter that comprises man. And the, that angel takes the whatever is there of the child, very little, small, little matter, brings it before God, and, assi- and assigns certain characteristics to the body. That's what, that's what we're told. Then there's another angel, whose name we do not know, who's not in charge of bodies, but is in charge of souls. And the Almighty tells that angel, go to the box, go to the chamber, and select this particular soul, what its name is, what it looks like, and bring them to me. Which tells us, very interestingly, that not all souls are equal, not all souls look alike, and they all have a distinct identity. They all have a distinct persona. So the other angel goes, and he takes, uh, goes to the box, pulls out their soul that the Almighty requested, and brings it before God. And when the soul is there before God, so the, the word it's described, when it shows up, it instinctively responds. Instinctively, it starts bowing down and prostrating itself before God. And then its joy and jubilation come to a shattering halt. Because God now has these two angels, one holding the primordial biological matter that's going to comprise the body, the other one holding the soul. The soul's prostrated. can't believe it gets to meet God. What an experience. And the Almighty says to the soul, you see that? You're going right in there. It's, it informs the soul, right now you're going to fuse. And this is before conception or at conception. And the soul responds as follows. It starts protesting. And it's very interesting to read. I'm going to read the exact words of the, pro- of, of the protest. Ribono shalola, master of the world. Dai li ha'olam shahayisi dar miyom shibirisani. I'm happy, I'm content in the world that I was always in from when you created me. Why are you putting me in to this putrid drop? The soul is revolted by the notion that it's going to be merged and fused and bound to this biological, physical matter. And the soul continues. I am pure. I am holy. I come from the holiest entities. And you're putting me into this disgusting piece of biological matter. It's absolutely revolted. And the Almighty responds to the soul and tells the soul, you don't want to leave. You're happy in this world, in the spiritual world. You should know that the world that I'm going to put you into, it's a lot better for you. It's a better world. Further, when I created you way back when, in the 60 days of, of creation, I actually created it with the explicit intention of you eventually being fused with that biological matter. And the soul is not placated at all. It's not happy. It's not convinced. And the Almighty forces it in and binds the two together and appoints two angels. It's not clear if these are the same angels or these are different angels to stand guard so the soul does not escape. The soul is so disappointed at conception, it would really escape, which by the way means suicide, because you know what a body without a soul looks like? It's a dead body. And it wants to escape, and the Almighty says, no, I'm gonna, you're forcing you in there, and you're gonna stay there, and no matter, no matter what, I'm gonna have two angels to guard you there. Now what's really interesting about this, if we wanna deconstruct this development of the soul, will notice two things. You notice the soul is very unhappy with God's suggestion that he go into the body, whatever the body is comprised of then. But if you actually look carefully, if you read it very critically, you'll notice that there's two distinct 
issues that he's raising. I'll read it again. Master of the world. I'm happy and content in the world that I was always in. Why do you want to put me in this other world? That's number one. He's disappointed. He was in the spiritual world. Now he's going to be in a physical world. Number two, why are you going to insert me into this putrid drop? I am holy, and that drop is not holy. So it has two distinct problems. It says there's a spiritual world and the physical world. I want to stay in the spiritual world. But also, I'm holy. That physical entity is not holy. We're going to be morphed together, and my identity as a pure, unadulterated, isolated soul is compromised. And the Almighty responds uh, to the first question, you know, the world, the world that you like this world, you should know that the, the, the next world is even better for you. Oh, and when I created you, I created you to, to morph you into this drop. Now, I want to just stop for a second here. If we were to look at the soul before it goes into any body, of course, it's not a fully developed body. It's, it's by body matter. We, what's very interesting about this is that the soul is having a debate and a dialogue with God. Do you know what we call that? We call that prophecy. We call that prophecy. To talk to God is prophecy. Furthermore, what's clear from the sources, and you'll have to trust me on this, but if you want one of the sources, the Ramam Yisodei Torah Per Zayin in chapter 7, the source indicates that of all the prophets that have existed, all prophets, with the exception of Moses, did not have prophecy with God directly, only with an angel. So this soul, any soul, so long as it has not been sullied yet, it's not at all morphed with a body, it's not in the other world, it's capable of prophecy direct with God. Indeed, it's instinctively submissive to God, because like we said, right the second word appears before God, it automatically responds and starts bowing down. If you were to, if we can isolate a soul in that status, it's the most pure thing we could possibly imagine. And now it's being, that's being changed. It's going into a physical body, it's going into a physical world. And it, it, it is very disappointed about it. Then it starts protesting. And it protests on both accounts, and the money has to respond on both accounts. So what's interesting here, if we ask the question, okay, the soul is pure, but its purity is potentially uh, under attack, under assault, what we actually see, if you look at the sources, the soul is from a spiritual world, and the soul is used to being isolated, not having a body to contend with for primacy. And way back at conception, the soul is already protesting. It doesn't want to be put into a physical body. It doesn't want to go to a physical world. I.e., it, it recognizes that's an attack or a potential attack on its purity. Let's move on a little bit here. So what happens to the soul in utero? So what happens, the Midrash describes, now the soul and the physical are bound, and it's thrust into back into this world in, in utero. And there's a list of... Uh, of qualities that describe the soul between conception and birth. So this is not really relevant to our discussion, but already at conception, the soul has, the, the body or with the child or the zygote or the embryo already has a soul. The soul is already there. But the soul is there, but it's already compromised on those two ways like we've, like we've mentioned. But if you look at the sources, the sources indicate really fascinating teachings about the child in utero. For example, anyone here knows what uh, uh, the, the Talmudic teaching about the child studying Torah in utero? Anyone heard of that? Okay, that comes from this source. Uh, the, ta- the, the Talmud indicate, or Talmud, Talmud says that a child in utero knows all of Torah. Further, the Talmud says that there's a candle lit upon the child's head and the child sees from one end of the world to the other end of the world. And a fourth thing that happens to the child in utero, the best days of a person's life 
are spent in Europe. These are the four teachings of the Talmud. It's very cryptic, right? Very cryptic. What's going on over here? Child knows all Torah. What does that mean? How, do, how does a child know Torah? What's going on over there? Candles lit on his head. If you actually look on an ultrasound, there isn't a candle lit on his head. And furthermore, I would argue that would probably be a, a little bit of a fire hazard. It's a little bit of a cramped environment. So we have these teachings that there's a candle on his head. He sees from one end of the world to the other end of the world. Obviously, there's something hidden beneath these words. Now, what this actually means is that the soul is already tempered. It's not quite the way it was prior. But at birth, it's going to be even more tempered. And we'll get to that in a little bit. If you actually isolate the soul in utero, it too is capable of prophecy though not with God, with an angel. And indeed, the soul, even in its state in utero, has the capacity to know all of Torah. The soul is under attack, yes, but it still maintains its purity to the degree that it has all of Torah innately. And this is all captured by this teaching. There's a candle lit on his head. What that means is, Ner Hashem, Nishmat Adam. Every time it refers to a candle, a candle is a hint to a soul. The candle of God is the soul of man. A child in utero, the soul and the body are fused together. But which one of them is dominant? Which one of them is stronger? The soul, the candle, i.e., is on the head, so to speak. The primacy of, uh, of this balance of body and soul is given to the soul, the consciousness of the child, so to speak. If we could, if we could interview a child, we can't, but if we could, they would be soul first, body second. I'll give you an example. If you're hungry, your stomach groans. If your soul is hungry, you don't feel anything. Why? Because we, once we're born, we're actually, the body is much more dominant than our soul. But in utero, it's flipped on its head. The soul is more dominant. The soul's on the head. Whereas the body is kind of just there. In fact, the child doesn't address any of the needs of their body in utero. Those needs are addressed elsewhere. The child studies Torah, i.e. the soul is still in its prime. Now, what indicates uh, the levels of prophecy of a child in utero? So remember those two angels that were there guarding him so he shouldn't escape? The Talmud continues and says that while the child is in utero, these angels give him a tour. They give him multiple tours. Every morning they give him a tour, and every evening they give him a tour. They take the, they take the soul, so to speak, so to speak. They take him on a little bit of a walk, and in the morning they go visit Gan Eden. They go visit the resting place of Tzadikim. And the Talmud describes it as follows. The angel takes him from there and gives him a walk to Gan Eden and shows him that Sadiqim, the righteous, that they're sitting with honor and they have a crown on their heads. And the angel asks the soul, do you know who these people are? So he says, how am I supposed to know these people are? I don't know who these people are. He says, well, these people... They were once just like you. They were once just a soul that had no idea what was going on, didn't live a life yet. And they got to the world, and they did mitzvos, and they studied Torah. And now when they died, they merited to have this great lavish experience. And you should know that I'm going to give you a tour of some other people that have had a different result. And you, if you, when you got into the world... And if you do mitzvot and you study Torah, you too will end up in this select fraternity. And that's the morning tour. The evening tour is to a different place. It's the Gehenim. And the angel takes the soul again for a walk. And he shows him, he shows him that the prosecuting angels are taking these little whips of fire and smashing, hitting the Rashaim, the wicked. And having no mercy in them. And the soul is once again questioned by the angel. Do you know who these people are? Just how am I supposed to know who these people are? I have no idea who these people are. 
And he says, you should know, these people were exactly like you. They too were given this little tour. And they too lived a life, but they ignored and abandoned the Torah and the mitzvos. And you should know that if you choose to opt to follow their path, you too will end up being here. So he shows him the tzaddikim and the rishayim. And he says, you should choose to be a tzaddik. And thus, the child indeed experiences prophecy through an angel in utero. And all that happens until birth. What happens at birth? At birth, the final blow to the purity of the soul is administered. Talmud says that a child at birth receives what's called a yetzerah. Yetzerah is a force that is so powerful and so antithetical to the soul that it actually extinguishes that candle that's on his head. And it actually causes the child to forget the, the Torah. And it causes the child to be incapable of prophecy. And it causes the child to forget everything. And indeed, just like the child is protesting at conception about the two problems, the two disappointments that it's having with its degradation, with being introduced into a foreign world, being introduced to a foreign body, it likewise again protests at birth because it's now being blanketed with a Yetzer Ra. Indeed, if you actually look at the verse that I quoted earlier, Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, the soul of, uh, the candle of God is the soul of man. The verse continues, Chofes Kol Chadre Batim, searching the chambers of the beten, of the innards. So you remember we had the, we had the candle on the head? And now the candle is in the stomach, so to speak. And that is symbolic of the final degradation of the soul. Whereas previously it was in someone's head, it was in their consciousness, in utero. Now, with the arrival of the Yetzirah, it's in the stomach. You know, if, if someone hid something in your stomach, you'd never find it. You'd have no idea. Well. You, you, don't, you don't know if it exists or not. <laughs> you, you know, if I asked a child, I'll give you an example, if I asked a child... Uh, or, or as an adult, you know, if you didn't know otherwise, you wouldn't be able to feel your appendix, right? So suppose someone's appendix was taken out when they were a kid. They, they wouldn't know of it as a, because it's within them theoretically, but it doesn't at all impact their perception of life. It, it's not, a, it's not a factor in determining what they choose, what they do. It's there theoretically, yes, but now is the third time where it is downgraded in its purity, and its holiness. Thus, to answer our question, the oath administered to a child at birth says, your soul is pure, but it can become impure. We now know that there's three reasons why the child can become impure. It can become impure because there's the factor of this world, there's the factor of this body, and thirdly, there's the factor of the Yetzer Ra. And indeed, if you actually look at the soul's development, in three episodes it's disappointed. It's disappointed when it's put in this world, in this body, and when it gets blanketed by the Yetzirah. And right before birth, the child is given an oath. Be a tzaddik and don't be a rasha. Number one. Number two, your soul is pure. Guard it from those that are trying to sully it, from those that are encroaching on its purity. What that's telling us is one of the same. We said, well, what, to be a tzaddik, what does that have to do with the purity of the soul? The answer is, what it means to be a tzaddik, it means to uphold the mission of preserving and guarding and maintaining the purity of your soul. I.e., all those factors that contribute or that can potentially contribute to the soul becoming impure, like we said, it's, 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 it's a variety of things. It's, it's a body, it's this world, it's a yetzerah. All those three are reasons or opportunities for someone to become a tzaddik. A tzaddik means guard the purity of the soul from the encroachments of the factors that can cause it to become impure. And indeed, we could look at life that we're this mission that we have. It's it's a battleground, but it's 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 really a three pronged war. On one hand, there's a con- there's a conflict of identity. We, are, we have a body and we have a soul. 
but who we view ourselves to be depends on our choices. We can identify as a body or as a soul, or somewhere in the middle within that spectrum. And that's, and that's going to contribute to the purity of our soul. That's conflict number one. Conflict number two is this world versus next world. This physical world or the spiritual world, which is a question of purpose. Which purpose are we living for? Are we living for this world? Well, we know this world, it's, there's a shelf life to it, right? We know when you're dead, whatever you invested in this world, right, it has no value to you. And thirdly, it's a question of Yetzirah. Now, Yetzirah is classified as a foreign god, which means it's a question of who's our master. Are we subjects of God, or are we subjects of the Yetzirah? Because the Yetzirah says to do something which is against God. Thus, they are in opposition, and we are conflicted because we have two masters. We have God who tells us to do one thing, Yetzirah tells us to do something else, and we have to choose which one of them we follow. So if you remember... When we, when we started, we said that we see in the sources many different arenas where the classification of a tzaddik is given. For example, if someone does mitzvos, they're rendered a tzaddik. If someone is eligible for olam abba, they're called a tzaddik. If someone resists their yetzerah, they're also called a tzaddik. And we asked, shouldn't it be a single unified definition? Why is there so much disparity and so much diversity amongst the definitions of what a tzaddik even is? And the answer is, is right here in front of us. A tzaddik in general, broadly speaking, means resist the opportunities for the soul to become impure. Well, how could the soul become impure? It can become impure in three different ways. Thus, the three different definitions of, of what it means to be a tzaddik directly correspond to the three potential ways our soul can become impure. Let's go through them one by one. Our soul can become impure because of the Yetzirah. The Yetzirah comes at birth, it can make our soul impure. Because it's a counterforce to everything the soul stands for. Says the Talmud, if someone fights their Yetzirah, they become a tzaddik. And the answer is quite simply, because the, one of the primary reasons why our soul can become impure is because of the Yetzirah. Thus, if you resist the Yetzirah, that renders you a tzaddik. Additionally, we're told, if someone merits olam abba, they're a tzaddik. If someone merits the world to come, they're a tzaddik. If someone lives for the spiritual world, they're a tzaddik. Well, if you remember, the soul was disappointed with that transference from one world to the other. I.e., if someone lives for olam abba, then they're showing that they're living in a way that makes their soul happy i.e. they're preserving the purity of the soul. They're not allowing the soul to become impure in that realm. And that thus renders them a tzaddik. Thirdly, if someone does mitzvahs, what is a mitzvah? We think of a mitzvah as a good deed. The truth is a mitzvah is an activity of the soul. The 613 mitzvahs, the Talmud tells us that there are corresponding to that 613 parts of our soul. Parts of our soul and our body, because the body and soul are mirrors of each other. Thus, what it's telling us is that you have a soul, but are you nourishing your soul? Are you tending to your soul? Well, a mitzvah is a is food for your soul, for a certain part of your soul. 613 mitzvos, well, that feeds the entirety of your soul. Thus, if someone's body is, let's say, removed, let's say magically we could remove the body. We could just see the soul. Will it be healthy? Will it be nourished? Will it be well-maintained? Depends. Do they feed it? Do they tend to its needs? If yes, then it will be. If they say that some mitzvahs are not for me, what they're doing is they're alienating themselves from certain parts of their spiritual uh, anatomy, so to speak. The build of their soul. Because a mitzvah is food for the soul, and thus, when someone does a mitzvah, they're choosing to identify as a soul. Because you know why? Your body doesn't need mitzvahs. When someone says, I'm going to act in this way to feed my soul, they're choosing to identify as the soul and thus to negate the cause of the soul's potential impurity. And thus they are rendered through that as a tzaddik. And I think, you know, if the only takeaway that we have from this is that what's the purpose of mitzvos? Mitzvos are there to make us a tzaddik. What does that mean? It means to make our soul pure i.e. by feeding your soul, that's a very valuable lesson. A lot of people are 
perplexed. So many mitzvahs and some and many mitzvahs don't have to do at all with improving society. And that's because we some people mistakenly say that a mitzvah is a good deed. Of course it's a good deed. But it's not vital necessarily to do all the things, all the mitzvahs to make the society better. If mitzvahs were merely about making a functioning, good, moral society, we'd have seven of them. Seven Noahide mitzvahs. A mitzvah is the opportunity for someone to achieve completion. We don't want to arrive to the spiritual world with a, with a soul that's missing limbs, missing body parts, so to speak. It's for ourselves. It's to build our, or to maintain and sustain our self, which is our soul, which is our real true identity, which what lives on beyond our time here in this world. So that's, I think, a very about, valuable uh, takeaway. But uh, just let's fast forward to the end of someone's life. Someone lives their life, they make all their choices that they do. And like we said, if someone chooses to be a tzaddik, to do mitzvos, to live for the next world, to resist the incursions of the Yetzirah, to maintain the purity of their soul, well, what happens at death? Actually, interesting here is that the exact same way something is done, it's undone in the reverse order. It's unraveled in the reverse order, exactly. What actually happened at birth was the Yetzirah being placed upon a person. That's actually the first thing that gets removed at death, because it's all undone in the exact, in the, in the exact reverse order. So the Yetzirah, right, that is a cause to potentially cause our soul to be impure. That's undone at birth. I'm sorry, that's undone at death. That's foisted upon us at birth and it's undone at death. So what's death like? So the Talmud tells us, this is the Talmud in Brachos, not, uh, page eight, <laughs> that there's 903 different types of death. So what are the margins, right? What's the best kind of death? And what's the worst kind of death? So someone says the worst kind of death is called Askara. What's Askara? So Askara, says the Talmud, it's, it's remember, we're pulling the, the Yetzirah out of the person, really out of the soul, off the soul. So death is exactly mirroring the relationship of the soul vis-a-vis the Yetzirah and the impurity that it may or may not have foisted upon the Yetzirah, uh, on the soul. So, Talmud says, the worst kind of death is called Askara. Askara is akin to, you have a ball of wool, and there's thorns that got stuck in the ball of wool, and you have to remove those thorns. And you know what? If you do that, wool is very thick. To pull it out, it's a very arduous, laborious process. It's not easy to separate the two. And even when you do separate the two, little flecks of wool are going to come along with it. Little bits of thorn are going to stay inside. That's the worst kind of death. Do you know why it's describing this? It's describing someone's soul that became impure. The Yetzirah encroached upon it, became irremovable from it. you got to remove it. It's a very difficult process. The best kind of death, says the Talmud, is called Nishika. And that is, if you have a glass of milk and you want to remove a, a hair from it, that comes off very easily, very seamlessly. What this is described, and that's a soul that maintained its purity. It, it too had the Yetzirah there. It too had the reasons for impurity present, but it, fulfilled, it became a tzaddik. It fulfilled the mission that was entrusted to it at, um, in the oath, the soul was pure, the Yetzirah did not cause it to become sullied, and thus to remove it is very seamless. And one more quick thing, and then I'll finish. And then we'll ask more questions if you want. If, if someone is successful at eradicating the Yetzirah, for example, suppose that was possible. How do you become a prophet, by the way? You know how you become a prophet? Your soul is already, cap- everyone's soul here is capable of prophecy. We've demonstrated that. The soul is taught, our soul is taught to God. Our soul is taught to angels, which is a lower level of prophecy. The only reason why we're not prophets is because all the factors that kind of separate us from God, the Yetzirah, our body, this world, all the, all those are like barriers separating us and God. If we just remove the barriers, automatically we'll become prophets. And automatically everything that we have the purity of our soul is still pure, it's just covered up. 
we remove those, we can become prophets. That's how you do it. Abraham studied Torah on his own. You know that? Talmud says, Abraham studied Torah on his own. How did he study Torah? He studied Torah from his kidneys. You remember, we said that someone's soul goes into their stomach. What Abraham actually did was, he exposed his latent soul, he undid the Yetzirah's influence that happened at birth, and automatically he reached the spiritual level of a child in utero, with the soul is, you know, it's still not as perfect as it could be, but it, un- it un- he untapped its potential. And thus, the fact that the Torah was with the child in utero, child in utero knew Torah, well, he knew Torah as well. And indeed, all the great leaders of our people, indeed, this is, this is, this is really what we're doing with Torah and mitzvahs. We're trying to preserve the purity of our soul, and we're trying to become a tzaddik, and my hope is that we can all do that very successfully. And I thank you all.